Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this very snowy day in DC. Stop prosecuting abortion. We must stop abortion opponents from achieving their vision. It is a vision of a world where people are jailed, imprisoned, and even executed for having abortions. We speak today on the dawn of the 46th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decision that affirmed the federal constitutional right to abortion. This marks the first Roe anniversary that abortion ha opponents have what they have dreamed of that whole time, which is a Supreme Court majority poised to overturn or gut Roe v. Wade. They could do this against the backdrop of an electorate that profoundly disagrees with them. Polling released this week by Perry Undum shows what they say is the highest support they've seen for abortion rights in decades. 73% of respondents said they didn't want to see Roe v. Wade overturned, and 67% want abortion to be legal in all or most cases. My name is Erin Matson, and I'm co-founder and co-director of ReproAction, a national group formed to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are launching a Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign um, with the release of our first video asking abortion opponents simple, important questions about the America they seek. Let's take a look at footage taken at a protest held by Operation Save America, an extreme national anti-abortion group that has met with government officials, including Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin. We asked these protesters and anti-abortion leaders if women should go to jail for having abortions. Here's what they had to say. Well, abortion kills a lot of people, so abortion is just as punishable by death as, as any other murder. Amen. Operation Save America, an extreme national anti-abortion organization that has met with government officials, held a protest outside an abortion clinic in Milwaukee. Many protesters and speakers that day traveled from all over the country. We asked them their thoughts on women who have been sent to jail for self-managing their own abortions. So Pervy Patel served over a year in prison in Indiana for giving herself an abortion, is that right? Yes, absolutely, I live in Indiana. So you're familiar with that case? I am familiar with that case. I'm also familiar with the piece of legislation we have that will criminalize abortion. And you support that? Absolutely. Yeah. I petitioned for it. I campaigned for it. That's good. So do you think that the doctors should be going to jail? They should be executed. Yes. They should be executed. Yes, God's law. Is, should women be punished for not obeying God? And the answer to the question is, is, is broader than that, but the, the short answer is yes. So do you think that women should go to jail? If you don't want to see a woman suicidal, then how do you want to see her in jail? Well, if she's committed a crime, then that's I mean, you, you would have a problem with someone who molested a child, right? You'd want to put them in jail, right? It is a sad, sick act. It is a crime, and it's really sad, but I just want you to know Jesus loves you. And what about people who say that women should go to jail for having abortions? Do you think that's right? Women should get the death penalty for having abortions. No, women should not go to jail. The people that kill the baby should go to jail. The doctors, because they committed a murder. The women murder, they, the women too, they, yeah. they are accomplices to murder. Yeah. They know it. We must keep abortion out of the criminal code. Tell anti-abortion lawmakers to put down the handcuffs at ReproAction. Org. Today, abortion opponents who call themselves pro-life will march to the Supreme Court. They will do so after watching, them, after watching Trump address them live by video for the second year in a row, and he's the first president to ever address this march in history. He called for punishing women who have abortions when he was a can candidate, and Susan B. Anthony List President Marjorie Dannenfelser subsequently called him, quote, the most pro-life president in history, unquote. 
Make no mistake, the outcome the March for Life is marching for is sending people, and especially women of color, to jail. At ReproAction, we know that women and people who can become pregnant will always have abortions, no matter what the law says. To take that a step further, we know that abortion pills have a special role to play in the United States, where for large groups of people, abortion is legal in name only. Abortion pills are safe and effective. We must increase access to them. Data from where abortion is extremely ex restricted, countries where it's extremely restricted, shows that women are able to safely and effectively take these pills on their own to end their own pregnancies when they use the World Health Organization protocol. We must share that protocol, and ReproAction has already begun doing so nationwide and at a grassroots level, person to person. We see the revolutionary potential of self-managed abortion to increase access to abortion, and that's why we've been engaged in this long-standing public education campaign to share information about abortion pills. Everyone deserves to know how to safely and effectively end a pregnancy. So too, everyone must know about the pitiful state of access to abortion today, rampant pro-life harassment against abortion providers and people who seek abortions, and also prosecutions for self-managed abor abortion and pregnancy outcomes that is already happening in the United States today. It is a gross infringement of human rights to incarcerate people because of their own pregnancy or abortion. We are launching our Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign so that people can see what abortion opponents have to say about prosecuting people who have abortions in their own words. In the face of anti-abortion harassment and violence and some hostile lawmakers, judges, the entire reproductive health, rights, and justice community is united in doing everything we can to ensure that people get access to the care that they need and deserve. So I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, and I'll start with Eleanor Smeal, who is a national leader for women and girls. She is president of Feminist Majority Foundation, which just released its 2018 National Clinic Violence Survey. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you, Erin. Um, the attack on abortion clinics, and, and when I, when I'm going to go through our survey a little bit. Uh, the Feminist Majority Foundation runs the National Clinic Access Project that fights uh, or tries to reduce violence against clinics. And why do you need such a project program? Abortion is legal in our country. Uh, uh, comprehensive reproductive health clinics treat all kinds of illnesses. Uh, they do cancer screening. They do STIs. They, they uh, help women get low-cost uh, reproductive health care. Um, and yet, even though it's a, a legal, it's helpful, it reduces maternal illnesses, and it reduces uh, maternal death uh, to have such clinics, uh, and they have to fight to stay there. And we often say we're on the front lines, and the reason we say we're on the front lines is because of the harassment, the intimidation, the threats, and the violence again, that is perpetrated by extremists, anti-abortion extremists. Just, let's think of some of the numbers. And what happened here uh, was in Wisconsin, but it's everywhere in the country. 62% uh, of clinics report that they have either daily or weekly harassment and threats. And daily or weekly anti-abortion activity, which many times is extremely aggressive. In fact, what they're doing is they're making people who are seeking reproductive health care walk a gauntlet, yelling at them, using terrible terminology against them, uh, frightening them, trying to intimidate them. Thankfully, thankfully, on our side, or the side of the women and the, and the men who are seeking help, and people who are seeking help, um, there are thousands of escorts working as volunteers. There are thousands of people who have been trained now in uh, legal observation so that they can report uh, terrorist activities. There are thousands of dedicated healthcare workers and doctors who cross those lines and, and provide safe care. 
And we think that it is an outrage that this kind of activity is going on. Our, our 16th our 15th um, survey we just, con just concluded for 2018, listen to these statistics. Roughly a quarter of all clinics in the United States are experiencing severe threats or severe violence. And we have typed all the different kinds of violence. It's everything from blockades, blockading the entrances, or stalking, or death threats, or actual physical violence. And it goes on. Now, another terrible statistic, and this is, this is now, this is our country. It's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not located just in the South. It's the Midwest. It's, uh, it could be West, East. It doesn't matter, wherever extremists decide to target. 52% of clinics are reporting that their healthcare workers, their staff, or their doctors are experiencing targeted intimidation and threats. They're trying to win with fear, with violence, because they have lost the real argument that most people in the United States want access to safe, illegal abortion, as Erin just said in her statistics, but it goes beyond that. Every year, women and men and people generally go to facilities uh, to have health care practice, to, to access necessary reproductive health care. And these clinics, if they close, and we know what happens when they do, in Texas, which has had tremendously restricted uh, um, laws and uh, have lost a lot of clinics because of uh, the government has cut off some funding, et cetera. Maternal mortality rates have doubled. That's in the United States of America. We could go on on all of the, the uh, statistics. I want people to see our report, but we have very little time. How can this be going on? Here we are in a country that believes in law, believes in democracy, and we have a lawless brigade trying to get their way no matter what, and who have such extreme views that they want to clo not only close, but they're also willing to create extreme violence. And we know this. It's a dangerous situation. Now, the good thing, and there is always light, uh, the very good thing is that thousands of people are guarding these clinics. They've learned nonviolence. Our side advocates nonviolence, and they uh, protect the workers. Um, the law is on our side, let's be real. Uh, there is a Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Act. Um, but that this is necessary shows you that they're not for life. They're for, for really totalitarian dictatorship type tactics. If you don't go our way, we will push you into going our way. We will threaten you. We will intimidate you. Um, and that has no place in a civilized democracy. And so we are determined. Now, one of the things that has happened, this number of one quarter used to be one half of all clinics experience severe violence. Since 1993, it has come down because of the vigilance of the pro-choice and pro-reproductive uh, rights people. But we want it to be better. There should be no fear. This is health care and it should be able to be exercised by the people who, whose life depends on it. They must be able to make their own decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Next up, we have Indra Wood Lucero, who is an attorney with the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, an organization with decades of experience defending clients unjustly prosecuted for abortion and pregnancy. Thank you, Indra. National Advocates for Pregnant Women is the leading organization providing free legal assistance to women who have been charged with a crime because a doctor or a police officer or a prosecutor thought they attempted to have or had an abortion. 
It's clear that if the Supreme Court overturns Roe, there will be more arrests and more women will go to jail. We say this with confidence because it's already happening. Our research discredits the pro-life claim that they can outlaw abortion without turning against the women who have them. It's now well documented that state actors are using anti-abortion, anti-Roe arguments to arrest and intimidate pregnant women. In fact, the New York Times series on the issue called A Woman's Rights is coming out in a special print edition this Sunday and is already online. For example, 2017 in Virginia, Michelle Roberts was charged with the felony procuring an abortion after she had a stillbirth and put the remains in the ground at her home. And Michelle Roberts' story is not that different from Ann Bynum in Arkansas, Kenlisa Jones in Georgia, or Anna Yoka in Tennessee. Prosecutors inspired by anti-abortion rhetoric are criminalizing pregnant women. It can be abortion or miscarriage or stillbirth or anything a law enforcement official believes is a risk to pregnancy, including falling down a flight of stairs or not getting to the hospital soon enough or having a home birth. We have documented over 1,200 cases like this, and these are cases since Roe, cases where but for being pregnant, a person would not be arrested nor detained. Jenny McCormick in Idaho safely ended a pregnancy with pills she bought online and was then charged with criminal abortion. Her case was resolved and the court determined that the application of the law to her was unconstitutional. And indeed, the reason we have ultimately gotten so many of these women out of jails and prisons is because Roe made clear that fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses inside a pregnant woman are not completely separate legal persons, but that pregnant women at all stages of pregnancy retain and are constitutional persons. Those marching today argue that abortion is the same as killing a child, that fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses inside someone's body are not different in any way from a child who has been born, and yet may be protected by state control of pregnant women, a kind of control that is never permitted for other people, not even parents of newborns. This argument provides the basis for much more than outlawing abortion. In fact, a New York state judge recently argued that since self-abortion is still a crime in the state, a woman could be forced to have a cesarean surgery based on the policy of protecting fetuses through intervention in pregnancy. This is from the case of Renat Dre in New York City, who was forced to have surgery even though she clearly objected. Miss Dre was in labor with her third child. She had two prior cesarean surgeries that required long, painful recovery and decreased her chances for future healthy pregnancies. She wanted to continue in labor to give her and her baby and her future babies the best chance at a healthy start to life. So she said, no, I will not consent to another surgery. But armed with nothing more than a scalpel and the idea that a fetus needs protection, the hospital decided to override her explicit refusal. The anti-abortion movement has come to stand for denying equal rights to pregnant women. They've done this through things like feticide laws sold based on the idea that they would protect pregnant women but are then used to prosecute them and things like sweeping protections for fertilized eggs as in Alabama's recent constitutional amendment. The so-called pro-life movement has come to stand between the millions of pregnancies Americans carry every year and the people who carry them. The anti-abortion movement has come to stand for empowering state actors to lock women up in hospitals, mental institutions, other facilities, not to mention jails and prisons, where they're forced to undergo cesarean surgery and other interventions, 
often to the detriment of their own health and the health of their pregnancies. Many of our clients are personally opposed to abortion, and they are shocked at the mistreatment they themselves suffered stemming from pro-life rhetoric. Without exception, they want to ensure that no pregnant woman ever experiences that kind of harm and suffering. To do that, we must make clear that anti-abortion rhetoric hurts women and families and does harm. The anti-abortion movement needs to be held accountable for that harm, and policymakers need to be disabused of the, of the notion that you can outlaw abortion without turning women into outlaws. Thank you, Indra. Now I am pleased to introduce Jennifer Wang, who is Deputy Director of Programs at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Foundation, and she works to build power for AAPI women and girls who have been especially targeted for pregnancy and abortion-related prosecutions. Good morning. I'm honored to be here today to represent the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, or NAPOF. We are the only multi-issue, progressive, community organizing, and policy organization for Asian American and Pacific Islander women and girls in the United States. Our mission is to build collective power so that all AAPI women and girls can have full agency over our lives, our families, and our communities. In 2011, in Indiana, a, a pregnant Chinese-American woman named Bebe Shuai attempted suicide. Bebe was pregnant. Bebe was convicted of murder and attempted feticide, and she spent over one year in prison. Two years later, Purvi Patel, an Indian-American woman also living in Indiana, had a miscarriage in her home and sought medical help at a hospital for heavy bleeding. After searching her cell phone, and finding text messages indicating that Pervy wanted to end her pregnancy, police charged Pervy with feticide and neglect of a dependent. Pervy was sentenced to 20 years in prison. She spent two years in prison. Meanwhile, thousands of National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum activists from around the country rallied, they educated their community members, they signed petitions, they court watched, and they poured their hearts and souls into our campaign to free Pervy Patel. This is because each of us can see ourselves in her story. In the fall of 2016, Pervy was released from prison. It is no coincidence that the only two women in Indiana to ever be convicted with feticide are Asian American women. It is no coincidence that during these same years, Indiana, now Vice President Mike Pence's Indiana, was also trying to pass a racist and sexist bill that would ban abortion in cases of sex selection, targeting Asian Americans based on the false stereotype that we prefer male babies. Anti-choice legislators claim that they were fighting gender discrimination but what they were actually doing was encouraging the racial profiling of Asian Americans and instilling fear among AAPI women seeking abortion care. What they were really saying to us all was AAPI women, women who look like me, cannot be trusted to make decisions about our own bodies and about our own lives, that we don't deserve the agency to do so. Let me be clear, this legislation has nothing to do with the health or well-being of AAPI women and girls. Bebe and Pervy's stories show us that. Rather, these attacks are smokescreen to hide an extreme anti-choice agenda. The truth is, Chinese, Korean, and Indian American women, on average, are actually having more female babies than white women in the United States. Despite a court's ruling that sex-selective abortion bans aren't just racist, they are also unconstitutional, the Supreme Court is deciding if they want to review sex-selective abortion bans, along with several other abortion bans. 
If these racist and sexist attacks continue on us, the rise of racial profiling of AAPI women and girls, people who look like me, when it comes to the criminalization of their pregnancy outcomes, will persist. We will not stand for this. Still, anti-choice legislators are exhausting all the pathways they can to make sure that the agency of women of color, especially immigrant women, remains out of reach for us. We have seen this administration go out of its way to prevent immigrant women from exercising their agency to make decisions about their lives and their families. This administration has blocked multiple women in detention from accessing their con constitutional right to abortion. It has issued a rule to force immigrants to choose between feeding and providing health care for their family or securing their immigration status. Right now, this administration wants to cement its violent separation of immigrant families and communities by building a wall, shutting down our government in the process. These are all attacks on our agency. These are all attacks on women of color. These attacks are inextricably linked to the racist and sexist attacks we have all seen on our communities who exercise our agency and self-determination. All of this and more is why we are building power. We are building this power to fight back against attempts to stereotype, criminalize, invisibilize, and silence us. Napoff will not rest until all AAPI women and girls have the agency they deserve to make critical decisions about our bodies, our lives, and our communities. Thank you, Jennifer. Now for our last panelist, we have Renee Bracey Sherman, who is Senior Public Affairs Manager at National Network of Abortion Funds. Thank you, Renee. Thank you to Repro Action for having us here today and for the work that you do to ensure that everyone is able to access abortion across the nation. My name is Renee Bracey Sherman and I am the Senior Public Affairs Manager at the National Network of Abortion Funds. The National Network of Abortion Funds builds power with members to remove financial and logistical barriers to abortion access by centering people who have had abortions and organizing at the intersections of racial, economic, and reproductive justice. We envision a world where every reproductive decision, including abortion, takes place in, a th in thriving communities that are safe, peaceful, and affordable. We envision a world where all people have the power and resources to care for and affirm their bodies, identities, and health for themselves and their families in all areas of their lives. As we shift the conversation about abortion, it will become a real option, accessible without shame or judgment. In, seven, in partnership with our 70 member abortion funds across the country, we are here to say, stop criminalizing abortion. Stop punishing people who seek to end their own pregnancies. Abortion is a safe medical procedure, and we hear from people all across the country who are navigating ridiculous and non-medical barriers to care in addition to a culture that stigmatizes and criminalizes them for seeking it. Abortion care is extremely challenging to access for those who call abortion funds. According to data from the Dr. George Tiller Memorial Abortion Fund, our national abortion fund, between 2010 and 2014, the distance callers had to travel to access an abortion doubled from 97 miles to over 199 miles and tripled for those seeking an abortion in their first trimester at 48 miles to those in their second at 175 miles. We're hearing from people who are unable to access clinics, thus have to find other means to access an abortion. Sometimes that means managing their own abortion, which can be a prosecutable offense. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, others simply want to manage their own health care in their home privately. More still want to avoid facing harassment or misleading information from fake anti-abortion health centers. These anti-abortion centers are run by people who want to jail people who have abortions. This is dangerous and unsafe and not the way healthcare should be. The impulse of anti-abortion extremists to punish people feels more vicious and dangerous than ever. When we live in a political reality that uses violent rhetoric to stigmatize abortion, 
Extremists are encouraged to use blatant anti blatant violence and harassment against people seeking abortion. That harassment includes violent laws that punish people for their reproductive decisions and outcomes, including but not limited to abortion. We know that people who call abortion funds, many in our own network, are disproportionately targeted based on the color of their skin, their age, where they live, who they love, and how much money they make. That's why we experience the criminalization of pregnancy. That's why, we, that's why as we experience the criminalization of pregnancy, abortion funds are joining forces and locking arms with other anti-criminalization work, particularly prison abolition and immigrant justice. It is time to take the hustle out of health care. People seeking abortions deserve compassion, unbiased information, and non-judgmental support. These are the things I had when I had my abortion at 19. Yet, when we hear the stories of most people seeking abortions, this is the exception, not the rule. It's time we stand up to the vicious anti-abortion harassment and say no to the future that they are proposing. We're proposing a future where everyone is able to make the decisions of their pregnancies without interference from anyone. They're able to raise their families free of violence, shame, and poverty. We want a world where everyone has access to healthcare, safe pregnancies, and unbarriered abortions. And that they have access to the safety net programs that allow them to thrive with housing, food, healthcare, and education. We want a world where families are able to move across borders and children can play in a park without fear of being arrested or assaulted. This starts with everyone being able to make their own decisions about their pregnancies without fear of prosecution, stigma, and harassment. Additionally, the anti-abortion movement has sat idly by as immigrant families are separated, children are dying in ISIS custody, and their own pro-life champions are openly slinging racist rhetoric. Earlier this week, Congressman Steve King was removed from his committee assignments for his egregious white supremacist comments. Previously, while leading anti-abortion House hearings, he called abortion black genocide and demeaned the lives of black women by comparing our decisions to have an abortion to the act of killing puppies. Representative King is also known for his disgusting comments about immigrants tweeting, we can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. This is as while he uses racist stereotypes about black and Asian women to ban abortion. He denigrates the very lives he disingenuously claims to defend. Once again, the anti-abortion movement is silent in the face of these racist atrocities as communities of color across this nation are vilified and disparaged. Those of us who have abortions, particularly people of color and with low incomes, are being targeted by this administration, Congress, and anti-abortion advocates to make up for their historically ineffectual ability to govern. We will not sit idly by while politicians deal out harm and jail sentences for political points. Everyone loves someone who has had an abortion. Our loved ones, particularly People like me who've had abortions do not deserve to be disrespected or criminalized for basic health care. It is time to stop criminalizing abortion. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That was fantastic. And I want to thank all of our speakers for powerful and, frankly, quite disturbing presentations. And at this point, I'd like to take questions. And a quick housekeeping note before, because we are recording this, what I need you to do is raise your hand and wait until the microphone comes to you before you ask your question. Please state your name and your affiliation, and then you may ask your question. Are there any questions? Yes. Ariel in the back. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I came late. Uh, I'm not sure if last night's vote was already addressed, but for us, if it could be repeated about the um, vote 
<laughs> Can we talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, may I assign that to Renee? Would you like to talk about what happened on the Hill last night with the vote? Basically, in the face of a government shutdown where people haven't been paid, they haven't been able to come to work and earn a paycheck, the Senate thought it was important to try to end federal funding of abortion, which already does not exist because of the Hyde Amendment since 1976, but it's reauthorized with the budget every year. So they, tried, they are trying to make it law. And so that way they don't have to reauthorize it with the budget every year. Here's the thing. They hate abortion so much that they are shutting down the government over it, over a wall to keep people out, to keep families separated, and then moving forward to push anti-abortion legislation. Why? So that they could do it in time for this march that they're having this weekend. Does that seem like our nation's priorities? I don't know about you, but it doesn't to me. And I don't know who the senators think they're listening to, but in the 2016 election and the 2017 election, the overwhelming population voted for pro-choice candidates. They have voted for a pro-choice agenda. Yes, Trump won because of the Electoral College, but the majority of Americans voted for a candidate who stood up and in support of the Hyde Amendment, repealing the Hyde Amendment. So this is why we are actually calling on Congress to reintroduce the Each Woman Act and ensure that everyone, no matter where they get their health insurance from, no matter what, whether they're on Medicaid or military TRICARE, or in the Peace Corps, that they should have access to be able to use their insurance to pay for an abortion. So just remember that the Senate is putting anti-abortion policies ahead of voting to reopen the entire United States government. And I'd also like to, before moving to the next question, I'd like to point out that our campaign lead, Shireen Shakuri, has written a blog post that's available at reproaction.org connecting the dots on why and how the shutdown is a reproductive justice issue. So may we please move? Are there more questions? Hi, my name is Arona Kessler. Um, I'm a volunteer with the DC Abortion Fund. But I'm originally from New York, um, where it was mentioned that abortion is still in the criminal code rather than the health code. And I was wondering what activists can do to spread the word about that and about the risks in New York. Thank you for that question. And first and foremost, ReproAction's Stop Abortion, Prosecuting Abortion campaign aims to shine a very accurate light on the true nature of abortion opponents and on the nature of abortion bans and anti-abortion policy under the law. So one of the first things that people can do is join us and to engage in direct action with us. We will be outside the Supreme Court later this afternoon in counter demonstration with allies from organizations that are based around the country to counter demonstrate against these folks and show their true agenda. They claim that they're pro-life as they're applauding this president who literally just today in the Washington Post cover story it shows that the White House underreported by thousands the number of children who were separated from their families at the border. So number one, we need to bring bold accountability to them with direct action. But number two, there are real policy solutions here. And I want to point people towards an organization that we are working with on a regular ba basis, and they're called the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, and they are, they are spearheading a campaign to end criminalization in New York State. So please check out those resources as well. Thank you. Are there more questions? Hi, uh, my name is Caitlin Blunny. Um, my question is, has the federal government given any indication that they support um, criminalizing abortion? Thank you for that question. I'm going to put that over to Indra.
Not only has this administration indicated that they're interested in criminalizing abortion and criminalizing pregnancy, the reality is it is how the administration is proceeding. It is what is happening. Even when it is just based on rhetoric, what we see in states and individual localities and counties is that rhetoric is taken by prosecutors and used to prosecute women for all kinds of outcomes of their pregnancy, even their own stillbirth, their own mis miscarriages. Um, and what we need in order to counter that is a clear establishment that pregnant women maintain their constitutional personhood throughout pregnancy at all stages of pregnancy. Thank you. Are there any additional questions before we wrap? OK, well, I want to thank you for attending our Repro Action Organized press conference to stop prosecuting abortion, particularly on a snowy day in DC where public schools are two hour delay for my own daughter. So I know it's hard for people to get here. And I deeply appreciate your attention to this very important and disturbing topic. As I just referenced, if you happen to find yourselves on the National Mall or in front of the Supreme Court today, look for the people in the orange shirts with the stop prosecuting abortion signs bringing reality to this March for Life. You will find us engaged in physical protest to hold the pro-life movement accountable for their callous commitment to throwing women in jail. No matter what they do with the laws, no matter what the Supreme Court says, no matter what Donald Trump says, we will do all the work that we can, all of the organizations based at this table, to ensure that people are able to access the care that they need with dignity, love, and support. Thank you so much.